What's up, everybody? Welcome into another Talk To Me Tuesday night. We're hanging out with To Me with Talk To Me Podcast. This is David from Dead. What's up, everybody? Welcome into another Talk To Me Tuesday night. From the new studio here at my new house at the new Talk To Me abode. We are waiting on Mike Spritzer of Devil Driver to log into this nice live stream. So we've got a few minutes to talk before before Mike Spritzer joins in. So as soon as he pops in, we will bring him on the screen. Devil Driver has a great new album coming out October 2nd called Dealing with Demons Volume 1. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've been uh, checking it out over the last few days. That is the album cover there. Yeah, Dealing with Demons Volume 1. Volume 2 looks like it will be out in 2021. And uh, we got a lot to talk to Mike Spritzer about. So once he joins in, we will get right into the Devil Driver talk. If you were watching on Facebook, watching on YouTube, make sure you're commenting. We can throw those comments up. Throw some banners up here. Make sure you subscribe to talk to me on all major platforms. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio. Yes, I am still, I am still on Spotify. So they have not taken me off just yet. <laughs> and if you feel like this show has value, make sure to head over to paypal.me slash talk to me. Throw me a couple of bucks. It's like a virtual tip jar for what we are doing over here at the Talk To Me podcast live show web stream. Robert. Hey, Josh. Well, hey, Robert. How you doing? It's very cool to see that you are chiming in. Hopefully, Mike will be popping in uh, soon, and we will get to talk with Mike Spritzer. But yeah, once again, just at paypal.me slash talk to me. Throw me a couple of bucks. That will be much appreciated. And let's see. Let's get that off there. But uh, I've also got some Talk To Me t-shirts. Make sure you are hitting up the social medias. See the nice pizza, headphones, skull logo, and I will get those out to you. Got large, got extra large, 20 bucks free shipping in the continental United States, and I will get those out to you ASAP. I know a little bit about the Postal Service, and I will get those out to you as soon as I can because I have some ends at the Postal Service. So... I've been seeing a lot about the Metallica drive-in concert. And from what I can tell, everyone that went to it had a fantastic time. The Speak and Destroy show, they did a nice little round table about it. I guess all three of them went to the Metallica drive-in, had a great time, let everybody know that it was fantastic. And they all said that they would do it again in this pandemic time. A uh, couple of people get together, throw in some bucks. Get out of the house. Do anything. Get out of the house. Check out some Metallica. I would go see a Metallica movie out. May or may not have went to see Through the Never. I know I definitely watched it on DVD once it came out. So it's it's not like you're not going to see a show. You're not going to go see a live show right now. So the next best thing, Metallica at the drive-in. And I love the drive-in. Now Metallica and at the drive-in, that would be a lot of fun too. Check that out. Got Robert checking in with the nice Metallica wall hangs. Those are actual vinyl records in some nice vinyl uh, uh, record. What do you call it? Frames. Got those up. Yeah, this is the new studio. It's a black. We painted the walls black. Kind of the, some of the same uh, features up on the wall here. Got uh, Rock and Pod, Kiss, Tennessee Titan stuff, Megadeth behind me, Phil Anselmo. Kill them all, ride the lightning, master puppets. Got a, I guess I've covered up my Cinderella record. Got night songs up on the wall back here. But we're just killing time before Mike Spritzer joins in. So if you are watching YouTube, Facebook, let's see if we can uh, get this up here. I might have to make this, pull this up. So I will actually, look, there's the new, Devil Driver album that we will be talking to Mike Spritzer about once he pops on. He texted me a little bit and said he is about ready to go. 
So let's see if we are if we are live. Sometimes I have to go in and I have to make it public so that you guys can join in, see what's going on, see how everybody's doing out there. Make sure you're checking out the new Devil Driver album, the song Nest of Vipers. Whew, I can't wait to talk with Mike Spritzer about that one because that, my friends, is a jam. And I can't wait. You know, I don't, I don't want to get too much into what's going on here. Oh, let's see. Pull down the devil driver. Got another comment. Got Robert chiming in one more time. Ask, I'm assuming he is saying that Night Songs is his favorite Cinderella album. It is also my favorite Cinderella album. And uh, it it's one of those things where at the time, and I've told this story on the podcast many times, but at the time when I was 17 and in high school, Fred Corey moved to my town outside of Nashville looking for bands to record. And he had built a studio with some friends and they were doing country music, obviously being in Nashville, they were, they were focusing on country music, but through a friend that owned a record store in Hendersonville hooked me up, gave me Fred Corey's phone number. A uh, 17 year old me calls gigantic rock star, Fred Corey. We go down to a studio. We had done some local demo stuff, played it for him. He enjoyed it. We ended up recording. Uh, we ended up recording like two or three demo sessions with him, and then he went back to Cinderella to do like some, uh, you know, the late '90s, early 2000s, uh, '80s rock revival stuff. Uh, we actually opened for Cinderella at Pops in St. Louis on one of those tours. It was like a, a greatest hits tour type deal, and it was, so it was us and Hair of the Dog and somebody else. But uh, it was cool, man. It was crazy because we had done a show with Earth Crisis in Akron, Ohio. And then two days later, we are in St. Louis, Missouri, opening for Cinderella. And so that was the appeal of that band. 12 Volt Negative Earth is what I'm talking about, where we could kind of open for anybody and play with whoever. It was a crazy time in the world of metal and hard rock where a band like mine could open for such diverse bands. But yeah, Fred is a great friend uh, to this day. I need to get him on one of these live streams and hopefully he will come on soon. He owes me one. So we'll hopefully get him on. And Robert's saying that's a cool story. So we need more people other than Robert chiming in, but Robert, I do appreciate you chiming in with, uh, but that's a cool story. So once Mike jumps on here, we will talk about the latest devil driver album, Mike is one of the few people that I've actually interviewed in person. Uh, we did that at the Mercury Ballroom here, right inside, right outside Louisville, Kentucky, or I am right outside Louisville, Kentucky. And he was at the Mercury Ballroom. I believe it was Devil Driver, Hate Breed, and at the time, The Devil You Know, which is now Light the Torch, featuring the great, the great, the great Howard Jones. If you listen to my other show, Diablos and Podcastica, you will know that the Howard Jones, Kill Switch Engage, Jesse fiasco turned, you know, it turned into a fiasco over there. Some of those guys didn't like my take on Kill Switch Engage, did not like my take on Led Zeppelin. But, you know, hey, everybody likes what they like and everybody hates what they hate. So hopefully we will have Mike Spritzer on soon. Got Chuck Wilson coming in here with what's up to me? Not a lot. Is that a dog in your profile picture there? We are searching for a dog right now. If you have a dog and you need a home for that dog, make sure you reach out to me because we need a dog. We just bought a new house and we need to put a dog in it. We attempted to buy two couches off of Facebook because we just need two couches for the basement, for the game room, for the kids to play video games, we got them, uh, the people to deliver them. And this house has been remodeled. So you would think that a house, you know, a couch just goes in a house, goes into a room, and you're there. This house, it's got a, like a lot of nooks and crannies going this way. So a normal couch will not fit in our basement and our game room. So these people brought over two couches 
and we couldn't get them in the house. Got them down the steps, and they were just like this close to getting around the corner. So we were probably going to have to get a futon, a couple of futons, <laughs> and uh, and just have some uh, some futons down here, maybe some beanbag chairs. I think that's what the lady was talking about grabbing. Anybody out there got some great new movies out that we need to check out, some music that we need to check out? I watched the new Bill and Ted's movie. We thoroughly enjoyed the Bill and Ted's movie, and my 14-year-old son came up to watch it with us, had no idea who Bill and Ted was. He was over there laughing, getting into it, having a great time. And from what I could tell, I had a great time watching it. Was it cinematic genius? No. Was it good? Yeah. Was it a good 20 bucks to spend on the um, whatever Amazon or wherever we got it from. Absolutely. We would have gone to the movies to see it and it would have probably cost us like 50 bucks from tickets and popcorn and sodas and just walking around with all this crap everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, hang on one second. We got to, that's an issue. We get internet problems with Mike. All right, two, four, two. You got to go for this. You know, talk amongst yourselves. We got Robert saying Cobra Kai on Netflix. I liked uh, the first season of Cobra Kai. I will have to watch the second season. And then as soon as the new season pops up, we got all kinds of stuff going on here. Come on now, internet. But yeah, the Cobra Kai on the Netflix was really good. Uh, War of Mechas. What do you think of the Deftones Ohms track? I love the Deftones Ohms track. Um, I was definitely uh, super into it as we, let's see here, invite a guest. I'm going to do two things at once. Yeah, Deftones Ohms, as soon as it kicks in, man, I was I was all about it. Uh, Chino sounds great. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm going to have to... Mike Sprites are great, you know, good, fun last name to have. Let's see. Instagram. Those are two... But yeah, it was uh, it was great, man. The Deftones Ohms track, fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed everything going on there. Let's see here. Link, send. All right, we'll see what happens there. New Deftones track. I cannot wait to hear more of the Deftones. Been trying to search all over the internet looking for uh, the Deftones contacts to get in to, uh, to, to talk to somebody because that is one band I need to talk to and get them on the show. Um, the guitars in the Ohms track sound great. Ch Steph playing a nine string guitar. Who's playing nine strings? It's crazy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so yeah, new Deftones is great. I cannot wait to hear the, uh, I believe they're releasing another single soon. It's supposed to be super heavy. And it's going to be a lot of fun. How about the new seven? Christina Gellert. Gellert? Gellert? Uh, how about the new seven dust? Blood from a stone. Awesome. I agree with you 100%. So far, everything I've heard from the new seven dust is great. Um, can't go wrong with seven dust. I mean, I think they've kind of found their formula. They're in their lane and they are just traveling down the seven dust highway. They're not veering off and doing a whole lot of different weird stuff. They've definitely got their sound down. And I think that they're, oh, and there's Mike now. So new seven dust is great. New devil driver is also great. So let me pull in Mike now. And there we go. What's up, Mike? How are we doing? How you doing, man? Can you hear me? All right. I got you good. Loud and clear, sir. <laughs> Some technical difficulties getting into here, right? Everything would connect at my house except my laptop. Nice. Sounds uh, sounds about right with the uh, never with the happened before, but of course it happens right when I need it. But <laughs> I don't know what I did, but I got it working. You're supposed to be a uh, technical genius, man. Yeah, well, sometimes uh, technologies don't work the way they should. But hey, I got it working. There That's you go. Important. 
And that's that's all that matters, man. Well, like I was telling the the the, the fans earlier, the new album, uh, dealing with demons. I guess a volume, and we lost my. Oh, there he is. Okay, uh, <laughs> dealing with demons, volume one out October second. Man, I'm loving it. If you love Devil Driver, you're gonna love this one, man. So it's a, it's a fantastic album. Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to get things right over here. Uh, so yeah, what were you saying about dealing with demons? <laughs> the space fantastic out album. If you are uh, if you're a Devil Driver fan, you're gonna love it. Um, it is. I didn't even realize that Nest of Vipers was the single until I got into a little bit more. Because every time Nest of Vipers comes on, I'm like, man. I see this song being played in front of a, a festival crowd with the entire crowd singing that uh, that that guitar line back at you, man. It's just it's just it's such a cool such a cool tune. Yeah, well, it's actually it's the third single. But well, it was uh, are, you one of the, are you one of the people that's heard the whole record? Yes. Oh, you have. Okay, yeah, cool. I got. You got the advanced yeah. copy. Yeah, they sent it out yesterday with like super strict warnings. <laughs> like if this oh, gets out, we're yesterday. coming after you. Yeah, they they sent it out yesterday. But I I grilled out listening to it last night and listened to it at work today. So great grilling album and a great work album. So there you go. Nice. Glad you like it. <laughs> That's cool, man. So uh so so tell me about Nest of Vipers, man. The what what is that noise at the beginning? Is that a guitar? What what instrument is that at the very beginning? You know what? Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, God, I would have to listen to it again to find out. Hold on a second. Let me pull it up. All right. Um, Doing while it I'm real pulling time. It, yeah, while I'm pulling it up, though, this is actually more of a Neil song. He wrote a majority of it. Okay. And let's see here. Technology is just not on my side today. Where is it? There we go. Let's see. Yeah, there's some sort of strange, strange. Oh, that, that's just uh, one of Steve Evitt's guitar pedals or a couple linked together. Okay. He's got a big old rack in his studio right behind where you sit of just pedals and pedals and pedals and pedals. And oh, so I didn't even see Steve. Yeah. I didn't see that Steve Evans did this one, man. What a, what a, what a great producer. He is a great producer. Yeah. He did our outlaws record and, um, because of how well we worked together with him on that one, we, decided to do this one with him as well the um you know it's a bit it's been a while since you and i have seen each other we actually sat down here in uh, louisville and did a nice little interview there and, and kept in touch over the years man but the um you know with with where am i going with this the <laughs> the success of devil driver over the last few years man kind of having to come to a grinding halt with the the pandemic and stuff did that help or hurt you uh, you know, kind of getting this album together, you know, were you guys planning on taking time off to do a record or was it, uh, you know, stop, stop touring, do a record. How, how are we looking on this one? The record was done long before the pandemic hit long before that record. Both of the records have been done for the better part of a year. Oh, wow. So it's like, I'm sure a lot of people get that impression because of uh, keep away from me, but uh, keep away from me. The whole song was written and recorded a good year before it was the the pandemic hit. <laughs> it just it, it just was works. A, oh, we're, it just works. That song had already been chosen to be the, the first single before the pandemic hit. It's just a, a weird coincidence. <laughs> well, that's always kind of been a uh, social distancer to begin with, you know. Yeah, the the song is. Um, I'm, I'm not, to tell you the truth, I'm not even hundred percent sure, uh, if that song is about a particular person or a group of people, or maybe just, you know, it could be about multiple things that something happened in Des's life, but it's not about the pandemic. 
<laughs> it's about his own personal pandemic. Maybe, but <laughs> uh, the video is the way it was because because of the pandemic. But uh, yeah, it is just like I said, one of those weird coincidences that uh, it just kind of tied into all the bullshit that's going on right now. The title, anyway. Now I had Des on during the uh, the Outlaws record. Um, for you, how was the doing the Outlaws record? You know, kind of taking those old country standards and 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 tracks like that and turning them heavy. You know, was that a challenge for you? Not really. It was fun, actually. I think it was a little bit easier to. Uh, it's a little easier to do than writing a record from scratch of original material because the idea is already there. You know, you've got right. your colors and you've got your canvas and it's all kind of laid out for you. It's just your own interpretation of it. And it was fun. You know, I got to record all the guitars and bass on that record at my studio. And we kind of did things a little bit backwards on that. We did the drums uh, after we did the the guitars and and the bass so um neil and i did everything here first and then we sent it to steve and he uh you know often went down to his studio to do it and then des finished it up at uh his house and um just outside of temecula in california at uh yeah, it was fun, you know, and we got a lot of guest people on it. You know, it was just one of those things that we wanted to do for fun, you know, and Dez's idea originally was to do a album of punk covers. And I like punk, but I'm not a huge punk fan, except for a few bands here and there, like, you know, the Misfits and uh, there's a couple others. But right. I didn't think, you know, we did this thing with... Um, Oh my God! What's the name of the band? Help me out here, Henry Rollins. Uh, Black Flag. Thank you. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Dude, I just I just got home. I rushed here. I was having internet problems. Like I'm just starting to mellow out from it. I just got done with a four hour drive. Oof. Uh, driving through LA, which was not fun. So anyway, we did this it was thing like many three miles, four hours and three miles. <laughs> yeah. Um, many years ago, we did a, a bunch of songs, a black flag songs for some kind of anniversary. I think it was, and we performed at the golden gods and we had like Jamie Josta, um, who else? Max Cavalera, uh, Des sang on a song and, um, another guy that used to be a pro skater that sings for black flag. Sometimes they all did a song with us and, uh, it was fun, but the songs are so incredibly simple <laughs> compared to what I'm used to doing with Devil Driver that yeah. um, I kind of reverted back to that when Des suggested doing, you know, a, a, a covers record of punk songs. And I was just like, I don't know if I can make them interesting or not. You know, they're right. they're so simple and it's like, I don't think a lot of punk bands, it's not meant to be technical and, right. and it's supposed the simplicity is what's cool about it. And I, you know, I was kind of at the time I just barely started listening to a lot, not a lot, but a fair amount of outlaw country. So I made that suggestion to Des knowing that he would say yes, because he loves that <laughs> stuff. Right. And, you know, I just told him, you know, it'd be a lot easier for me and Neil to rewrite, country songs than than punk songs there's just so much more in there in yeah. the songs that we picked and i'd rather you know punk and metal are kind of like cousins you know it's and <laughs> i don't i just don't think i could have made those those punk songs cool you know i'm sure a lot of people think don't that, think um, the country songs are cool either but i think they're cool <laughs> no i had a lot of fun i mean the one thing like metallica when they take like an old punk song and metallic guys it or whatever, make it a, make it a metal song. I know that Kirk has always talked about having to go back and write solos to the punk songs and kind of make them Metallica songs. And I think the Metallica is one of the greatest cover bands of all time. You know, when they, when they do a cover, they do it, 
you know, they do it well. So, and I think Lamb of God's kind of punk cover album they did, uh, as Burn the Priest recently wasn't too bad. So, I mean, it it can be done, as I guess is what I'm saying. It, it can be done, but for me, going the country route, yeah. there was just there's a lot more there for me to work with. And in Neil's case, we kind of had this weird dynamic where he would take songs that really didn't have a whole lot to offer, like Whiskey River. And the song is completely different. I mean, that song might as well be an original with just the Whiskey River lyrics over it. But a lot of the songs that he came to the table with and, you know, was uh, rewriting on his end were more like originals where I tried to, um, but the songs that I rewrote were more, you know, like in the vein of sale Yeah, that, you know, with the able nation song that we did, like it's, it's pretty, it's done. It sounds like devil driver, but it's pretty true to the original of the same, yeah. in the same sense. Well, see what was great for the, 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 the outlaw country album for me was growing up in Nashville. You know, you're always just around, country music all the time you know kind of can't get away from it in a lot of places and uh were you around for the john carter cash stuff were you able to meet him and kind of talk to him at all no i didn't go it was it just uh des and his wife anastasia went yeah uh neil and i were invited actually i mean the whole band was invited but uh um for some reason i couldn't go i can't remember why that's something else going on L.A. traffic. That might have been it. It's probably <laughs> stuck in L.A. traffic. You get stuck there, you're going to be there a while. Did um, yeah, It's funny, the first time I ever played in L.A., uh, it was the very first time I ever just saw a car flipped over. And it was just, and everybody's just driving past it like, no big deal, but it was just a flipped over like SUV just in a lane. And people were probably mad at the guy for being flipped over. <laughs> I mean they weren't zooming by i'm sure i'm sure they were going like five miles per hour at most yeah i mean it wasn't, if they, it was they, 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 they could pull someone over on the other side of the freeway yeah. and your side of the freeway will be just jam-packed with people and you know i'm just coming back from my family's lake house up oh, in nice. uh past the Robles, and me and my girlfriend went up there i uh fucked up my jet ski and so I had to tow it home with me. Yeah, the, they keep on letting water out of the lake. And it's, since I was up there last time, the lake level went down and I sucked uh, some rocks through the, uh, the intake. And uh, yeah, that, that didn't sound too good. And <laughs> luckily it still works. So me and my girlfriend could get back to the dock because we were a good three miles away from it at least. And uh but something wasn't sounding right. So like, ah, fuck, bring it home. So I got to take that apart sometime soon and see what's wrong with that. But so we're towing that thing through and we almost got into an accident when a guy doing probably 120 in, in traffic was just zimming through traffic. <laughs> and I had to slam on my brake because he was about to hit a gas truck or me. And luckily it didn't hit either one of us. But yeah, driving in LA sucks. I don't like it. Yeah, no, no fun, especially when you're in a uh, in, a, in a like 15 passenger van trying to get your band through on tour. <laughs> you're just like, you know, what? If, if I'm in the if I'm the bus and I'm, you know, obviously I'm not driving. I don't care, right? In traffic, but when I'm driving, yeah, I, 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 I do anything possible to avoid driving through LA. Uh, another question on the Outlaws thing was that something does that does that help your personal writing? kind of dissecting other songs and breaking them down to their kind of bare bones and, and rewriting them in kind of a devil driver way. Is that, uh, is that something that helps you, you know, when you move on to write other stuff? You know, it might have, I'm not really sure if I used any kind of the techniques that I learned from uh, rewriting those songs. It, it was interesting to me to, you know, when I sat down and I started rewriting them to see how they, how much different, they structured the songs compared to the way we, we, uh, <clears throat> or the way I do it right. most of the time. Um, and 
I remember thinking that I was going to try to implement that more into dealing with demons when we started writing for that. But I don't, honestly, I don't think I ever did. <laughs> and, you know, the funny thing is, is a lot of these songs are songs that I've listened to many, many times. And until you actually go in and like and dissect them, you don't really notice it. Yeah. At least I don't. And like the uh, one of the other songs that I really wanted to do was uh, the High Women okay. by the High the High Women, and it, all it is is it, it it's it's for you know the song is just four different country singers singing the same verse all in a row, and you know I started rewriting that song and I was like this is just not going to work with just Des singing it. Like we would literally have to get three guest vocalists to do this song to make it work. So that, you know, that didn't happen. We probably actually could have, before then, I didn't think Des was going to be able to find so many people to uh, guest on the record. Yeah. But, um, so I think we actually could have done that song, but um, that decision was made early on. So the question is yes and no. I might have used some of, the techniques that I've learned on when doing that record in a subconscious way, but um, I don't remember doing it on purpose. Like I'm going to structure a song, like one of the songs on the outlaw record. I don't think I did that. Yeah. You get a very weird, if you get into some of that older country, you know, sometimes it's just like, it's like chorus verse, chorus verse over. (laughs) And it's Mm -hmm. like a, and and it's like a minute and 47 seconds long. And, but it's like a a gigantic, massive standard. It's, it's, it's insane. How, how kind of simplistic some of that early stuff was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Speaking about, uh, you know, kind of one of the last tours you guys did was, was the, you know, static X, uh, I believe dope was on it and you guys, and I know that you guys pulled out some old cold chamber tracks, you know, how was it kind of diving into that <laughs> stuff and playing it, uh, playing it out for the first time? Well, I was, I was a little unsure about it at first, Yeah, but, um, any uncertainty immediately went away after we did it at the first show. I mean, every day that was a really good tour. Almost yeah. Every day was sold out. Um, I think actually every day was sold out except for maybe one or two. And those were really, really big venues that we got booked at, you know, venues that normally neither of our bands would, you know, <laughs> have anything to do with it. But, um, it was a really, really good tour and a lot of people there and everyone seemed to love it when we played those songs. And, you know, it, it was a nice breather you know, for like Neil and I, we always kind of like, we start joking around because lately Des doesn't really want to talk in between songs a whole lot. So we're just kind of like going from song to song to song. And we don't really have a whole lot of time to, to, you know, take a break and drink our beers that are always (laughs) on our amps at every show. Because we're the only two guys in the band that drink. Everyone else is sober. And, uh, or at least doesn't drink alcohol. And, uh, You know, the, the songs are fairly easy to play and you got to change guitars because we used uh, baritone guitars for, for those songs. And uh, it was fun, you know, and uh, I'm I'm totally down to keep on playing them, you know, as long as the fans are into it. I don't mind. Was that something where you wanted to kind of always keep Cold Chamber and Devil Driver separate? So that was maybe why you didn't want to add those songs to the set? Yeah, and I guess I'm a little bit traumatized from the baby days of Devil Driver because <laughs> in 2004 up until I would say like at least 2010, you know, new metal was it was just really frowned upon. Like it, it kind of it, it had its own little period in the late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like the whole metal crowd wanted nothing to do with it. And it was, it was, it was odd. And, you know, and it was hard for Des to get away from that. And I think there were a lot of people that didn't want to like devil driver because they didn't like cold chamber. And it's, uh, and now the funny thing is it's coming full circle, you know? And I think a lot of people, 
you know, I did have a lot of people like when we did Ozfest in '04, coming up to us at the signing booth and be like, you know, I didn't want to like you guys, but I do. <laughs> right. And I think it was just because I can say like it was like new metal got blacklisted all of a sudden, just, you know, it was just gone. <laughs> like, don't be in a new metal band. And <laughs> it was I guess it must have been, it kind of felt like I guess it would have when like being in a hair metal band in the eighties and when Nirvana dropped, yeah, you know, it just, it just stopped maybe on a smaller level, you know, I'm kind of comparing apples and oranges a little bit, but it kind of felt know, like that. It's pretty much apples to apples from, from my point and, of view. Except for the point that grunge is, was never frowned upon, at least right. not from my, from my point of view, like Nirvana was always cool. Soundgarden was always cool. Alice in Chains definitely always cool, you know? Right. And, but, New metal, except for, you know, there are bands that pushed through and got through it like Corn. Yeah. And, um, but I mean, they still had their low course. moments too, though. Yeah, they did. You know, I kind of forgot about Corn for a little while. And I, I tell you the truth, I'm a big Corn fan. I like a lot of their stuff. And it took that uh, dubstep record they did to regain my attention because I'd. I'd never really heard dubstep before. I don't really listen to it anymore. It was like a little, like a, a phase for me. Um, it got a little monotonous. Like it all yeah. just kind of started sounding the same, but I liked it because I'm a big industrial fan. Like I love industrial more than any other genre of music. Oh, and yeah. it was, to me, it was like modern day industrial. It's just noises and <laughs> beats and weird shit going on. I, oh, I, yeah. I, I love that stuff. So when Korn did that record, it my eyebrows definitely were raised. I'm like, all right, all right, you know. And I kind of have never stopped listening to him since. So um, yeah, I was a little bit afraid to play Cold Chamber songs. I didn't know how people were going to react to it. And yeah, and you know, I'm not a part of Cold Chamber. I'm a part of Devil Driver. And I was like, I don't know. Should we be crossing the streams? Is that a bad <laughs> idea? Is the universe going to implode if we do this? Um, and it did. So thank you for coronavirus and and everything else. So I'm, I'm pretty know, sure I, it's because you guys played Cold Chamber songs. It's yeah, that it, it totally fucked up the world. Look what happened. <laughs> we played some Cold Chamber songs and fucking COVID-19 hit. Well, I think it was the perfect tour to kind of bust them out. You didn't bust them out on a on a random Devil Driver tour. You busted it out on a tour, a kind of a nostalgia tour with Static X and Dope and and the you know the kind of the entire package was was pulling from that late '90s, early 2000s era. So pulling it out of those shows, I think was was probably perfect timing. I totally agree. And Dope and Static X are bands that Des played with. In- yeah cold chamber back in the day you know they all they're all la bands yeah and so i totally agree with that but and you know what one of my my all-time favorite cold chamber song is fiend i think that's the best song they they ever wrote i would like it way more than loco i I like fiend is i think is a really really well written song and um i'm not you know it was, was one of cold chamber's bigger songs yeah, but that was one thing that I told Des. I'm like, all right, if we're gonna do these songs, we're playing Fiend. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. all I asked. And yeah, I love that song. I love playing. It's fun. I was always I a big fan of. I, uh, I would do it more. I was always a big fan of Big Truck. You know, that's where you gotta go with that one. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like that song too. Uh, yeah, I mean, even towards the end of Cold Chamber, you know, I saw them. I saw them with Slipknot opening. It was like. Cold Shaper Machine Head with a op- little opening band Slipknot. And the places we would see was like packed out for Slipknot. Slipknot would leave and the place would, you know, half of the crowd would leave too. It was it was pretty insane that kind of uh dark period of both Machine Head and Cold Chamber. Yeah, Des he's he's told me some stories about that tour and um, he told me the very first day. Uh, I don't think he knew much about Slipknot at all. They just got thrown onto the tour and it was the, it was the first night of the tour and he walks out to go see him and he was just like, I guess his jaw was just on the floor like, <laughs> oh my God. And he actually walked up to the dressing room and I, Meigs was sitting there and he was like, dude, you got to see this. And <laughs> 
Um, I know that feeling a little bit because we played one show back in the day. Um, we were opening, we were on, I think it was 2007 and we were opening up for Dimmu in the States. Uh, fantastic tour. It was another one of those tours. Like it was shortly after they released Puritanical. I think they were on the death cult Armageddon album cycle. And uh, like every show was sold out. But for some reason, one show that we played at the electric factory in Philadelphia. Yeah. Philadelphia. Yeah. I was about to say Pittsburgh, but no, it's Philadelphia. And uh, behemoth was opening. And oh, wow. I, I think I had heard of them. I had seen pictures of them in like metal magazines and online, but I don't think I had listened to them yet. And I went out and watched them and I was just like, Oh my God god like this is one of the best live bands i've ever seen and i remember walking into the dressing room and all the guys were were in there and we're kind of starting to get ready for the show i'm like dude you guys you guys better make this show an 11 today because (laughs) that opening band behemoth is fucking scary like the scary good it like you know that was one of the only times i got a little intimidated by an opening band yeah, well, it's definitely. That's, yeah, there's nothing better though than going to a show for one band and then another band just completely blowing you away. Um, you know, one time we went to see uh, pop punk band uh, Motion City soundtrack, and they they were on tour with a band called Chiodos, and we had never seen Chiodos before. And Craig Owens came out and was a complete rock star. And I was just like, it's one of those where you just kind of mesmerized and blown away. I even saw like my chemical romance opening for story of the year one time. And I was like, well, this is the band, you know, this, this band's going to be huge. Uh, But yeah, man, it's just, it's just awesome to go see shows and, and other bands that blow you away. And it's a very hard thing to do to kind of win a crowd over of people that aren't there to see you. Well, you know that the same thing happened to me when I was in high school, I went to the Hollywood Palladium to go see, um, well, Lords of Acid was headlining, but uh, I mainly went to go see KMFDM. Nice. And this little unknown band called Rammstein opened up. <laughs> yeah. And I had heard of them from the two songs that they had on the Lost Highway soundtrack, because I, I listened to that soundtrack to death when I was in high school. A lot of me and a lot of my friends did. And so I'm uh, up front and lights go down and they open up with the song Rammstein. And, you know, it's just that slow, dun, 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 you know, and it's yeah. just kind of a, almost a weird song to open up with because it's so slow, but you know, they, they open up with that song till had that big, you know, metal trench coat on with his goggles with the laser pointer on it and just burst into flames you know like maybe 20 seconds into it and it's just like i could just the whole crowd was like okay the show's definitely over after these guys are done like it, it was like ever and after it like came fdm and north lords of acid and like as much as i love them they were just like well nothing to see here you know we just witnessed Rammstein. <laughs> i think that was their first tour in the states and they did some things on that show that I'd never seen before. Like I remember the, uh, the keyboardist flake got, um, one of those incandescent or, uh, fluorescent tube lights out and broke it over Till's bare chest during one of the songs. Never seen him do that again. Um, I mean, that stuff inside there is toxic. I don't know if they, it it was lit (laughs) up. (laughs) It wasn't like a a dummy light or anything like that. It was lit up and he just went and broke it right over his bare chest. I was like, you know, and being like 15 years old, I was just like, Jesus Christ, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I got to see them for the first time. I actually saw them two dates on the original family values tour with corn, Limp Biscuit, And I saw that too. And uh, it was Cube. one of those things where you went in, you're like, yeah, Ice Cube was there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so you know, that's the the fake dildo and, and you know, just spraying mm-hmm. the crowd with whatever. And yeah, it was one of the more amazing shows I've ever seen. And that's one of those one times where you dive into a band so much. Like we had a German foreign exchange student in our school. 
So I, 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 you know, rush to him and I'm like, what do these lyrics mean? You know, <laughs> and, and, uh, just trying to, trying to, uh, you know, decipher what Rammstein's talking about. Yeah. I, uh, my grandparents are, were, were full German. And when I was in high school, they they would go to Germany maybe every couple of years to vi- visit my relatives. So I gave them a, a list of Rammstein singles and albums. That, they only had two <laughs> albums out, out at the yeah. point. And I actually, I had I had both of the records, but they had all like six or seven, you, you know, singles. Like, you know, like the ones that Metallica put out yeah. on the Black Album, you know, and they had B-sides on it and covers, but you couldn't get them in the States, you know? It's like... It was, it was really hard to, you know, to get that stuff when I was a kid. And so I gave a list to my grandparents and they came home with this red box set with six CD singles in it and a poster. Nice. And I remember I did the same thing with my grandmother. I had her start translating some of the lyrics. And <laughs> I, mean, I think some of them she didn't want to translate for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, I bet there, there's a... She was like... Fun. Yeah, and like my grandparents, I mean, they were pretty highly Catholic, conservative, and um, I think I was like, I always wondered, like, did, did my grandmother kind of regret, or after I opened it up, because I opened it up at their house when, you know, they brought it for me. But there was a year, there was a year that my, uh, uh, one of the first years I ever started working, uh, my mom wanted to know what I wanted for Christmas, and I was like, I want these you know, band t-shirts. And she's like, well, send me a list and I'll try to go find them. And that was when, you know, she would go to the local uh, hot, I don't even think hot topic was around yet, but it was, you know, whatever store. And, uh, I sent her a list of like cannibal corpse and deicide and obituary and just all So I was late to Christmas. So when everybody, uh, when I got there, I opened my presents in front of like the entire family, my, my Baptist grandmother, that was the Sunday school teacher. And I'm, pulling up my tomb in the mutilated t-shirt like thanks mom you know my my grandparents were just like oh my god i brought that album tomb of the mutilated to school when i was in middle school i was in seventh 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 grade and you know i was showing one of my friends in class and my math teacher who was actually really she was cool and laid back but she was like, let me see that. And I was just like, no, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> that corpse, lady corpse getting eaten out by a male corpse that's like chopped in half. Yep. You know, it's like, it's a pretty brutal album cover, especially for <laughs> what year was this? Like, it must have been like 1990, 94, 95, something like yeah, that. There, yeah. And finally, she, I mean, she was just not letting me not show her that record and finally <laughs> i pulled it out and i'm just like dude she's gonna take it away from me and she's just like i think it caught her by surprise i thought she was gonna be like try to be the cool teacher and be like oh i like that and whatever she <laughs> just, you know hands it back to me like probably not a good idea to keep bringing that to school mike you yeah, know you might want to keep that one at home i might want to leave that one at home <laughs> a little bit yeah it was there weren't a, there weren't a whole i mean i went to a very uppity high school so some sometimes walk in the hall with my metal up your ass t-shirt or or a nice dsi mm-hmm. t-shirt you know I, I got i got sent to the the principal's office for my uh for my dsi shirt you know some stuff like that but yeah you know it's just it's fun to be young and be uh be metalhead right yeah my mom really i, I had two shirts that my mom really freaked out on when i was a kid and the first one was once again going back to a cam fdm concert I went to go see KMFDM and it was on Halloween and this band pig opened up yeah. and pig is a, is a solo project of a guy named Raven Watts that had a lot to do with KMFDM and some other industrial projects. And they had a, a shirt that said pig on the front and I still have it. Uh, <laughs> and it says, find it, fuck it, forget it on the back. And dude, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that song is about a guy getting screwed over by a girl and or and probably it was Raymond. That's my guess when I looked into the lyrics when I was a kid, but I just didn't think anything of it. And I knew my mom wouldn't let me wear it to school because it had the word fucking on it. But uh, I mean, that almost turned into world war three at my house. She just couldn't believe that I bought that. And I just couldn't believe that she cared that much. <laughs> and the ironic thing is, 
Um, just a couple years ago, I have a friend named Duncan Wilkinson that lives in London and he became friends with Raymond and did a remix for uh, a remix at record of a pig. And he was like, you know, do you want to play guitars on this remix that I'm doing? And I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, I do. You know, <laughs> right. Kim FDM and pig are, you know, two of my favorite industrial bands. And it also is like a way for me to, to connect with Raymond Watts, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, I, <laughs> I confronted my mom after I did, I'm like, you remember that band pig where he threw the fit about the shirt that find it, fucking forget it <laughs> on it. She's like, yeah, well I just collaborated with the guy on the song. <laughs> nice. And, what did mom uh, have to say about that? Ah, I mean, she's over it now. My parents are very well broken in. I'm the youngest of four kids and, my my oldest brother and sister they were like straight a students my oldest brother was valedictorian of his high school like pretty <laughs> ideal kids to have and then they had me and my other brother and yeah we were a bit more of a handful than than the other ones so yeah my parents they're very well broken and they're pretty mellow now did the uh, the grandmother that translated the Rammstein stuff uh, is she still with us? No, actually, all my grandparents are gone. Unfortunately, did, did they at least but, get to uh, see you play, or or knew that you had gotten uh, you know to tour and things like that? Uh, one of my grandfathers, yes. Uh, my dad's dad, he lived the longest, and he he never came to a show or anything like that, but um. He knew what I was... Actually, no, I take it back. My grandmother, too. I remember my mom calling me when I was in Nottingham, England once, you know, and my grandmother wasn't doing so well, and she was pretty old. And I remember, you know, she was like, you know, I know you can't come home or anything, but, you know, you might want to call her. And it's like, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to call her. So I called her up, and we talked for a little while, thinking that it was going to be the last time I talked to her. And the funny thing is, she lived for like two or three years after that. <laughs> so, oh, damn it, Grandma. Yeah, but my other two grandparents, they passed away to or, or, you know, before Devil Driver was around and um so they never got to see it. They wouldn't have really cared that much. Um I, my family is very supportive of what I do, but they're they don't have their noses in it at all. Right. Like my my dad'll come to some shows and you know, he used to have a friend that, you know, uh, that he actually reunited with a, a friend. Unfortunately, this guy passed away as well. But um, they would go to concerts together when they were a kid and they saw Black Sabbath, they saw Led Zeppelin, Cream, you know, all these bands mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s together. So he would bring them to my shows. And those would be like my dad, my dad's friend that would come to the show. Sometimes my one of my brothers would come, sometimes my sister and she would bring her family. But, you know, it's, it's one of the things I would make fun of some of the older members and other members of devil driver. It's like when they go <laughs> through their hometown, yeah, it, it's like, it's a whole ordeal. Like the mom comes, the dad comes, the cousins come, their kids come, the whole family comes and they're like, we'll be there at one o'clock to see you. And it's like, <laughs> fuck man. You know, like I don't want to be babysitting these people, you know, from one o'clock until whenever right. we go on at nine or 10, my family has never been like that. They're like, if you don't want us to come to a show, we won't come to a show. And you know what? There won't be any hard feelings whatsoever. <laughs> you know, my dad has called me and be like, you know, and LA shows are stressful sometimes, you know, yeah. and you know, everyone wants on the guest list. We don't have room. It's, it's just kind of a pain in the ass playing LA. And you know, my dad's like, Hey, you know, what do you, what do you think about me coming to the show? I'm like, dad, this is just, isn't, a good one like i'm i'm gonna be so busy with interviews i'm gonna be doing this you know i got other friends coming out that i'm gonna have to babysit and hang out with and um you know record label people whatever and you know like yeah maybe next time and he's just like okay cool you know see you see you when you get home you know and dude i am so thankful for that <laughs> it, yeah. it makes things so much easier like our old drummer uh, John and well, I, John, are, you know, all the three, the three guys that aren't in the band anymore, they're all from Boston. They grew up together. So okay. whenever we played Boston, you know, 
it's like every single person, all three of their families would be cruising out to the show. And I, I could just see the stress, you know, emulating <laughs> out of their pores all day, you know, and, uh, but not my family that they're just like, whatever my mom has been to, I think she came and saw me once. Yeah. But and it's just not my mom's thing. You know, she's seen me play. She's, uh, it's not enjoyable for her. You know, <laughs> my parents are both in their seventies, you know, they've worked their ass off their whole life and now they're, they're in their chill time. So, you know, let them chill. And they live a mile away from me, so we see each other all the time anyway. Nice. I think the last time you came on, we talked about your dad's hardware store. And after after the show posted, a good friend of mine that moved out to California years and years ago, she was like, oh, I know his dad. I love his dad. You know, like talking about the the. Did the he tell me about store. this? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I did, no. Uh no. Friend of, I think, <laughs> I, I think, I think she had bought some blinds or something, and and uh, and and she was like, he either said something about you being in Devil Driver or you were there or something, but it, it just kind of came came full circle of like, I shop at that hardware store. <laughs> I was like, well, that's no awesome. Shit. Yeah, so yeah. it was cool, man. It's you know, she's a, she's a a very good friend, and it was just that, that whole small world thing, I guess. It's kind of a staple in in Torrance where I live yeah. and while the riots were going on over here after the George Floyd thing, um, the whole mall near my house boarded up everything. And they even took city buses and barricaded all the parking lots. Oh wow. So no cars could get through into the parking lot. So every, you know, for like three or four days, it was like that. And, you know, I was like, man, you know, dad, we better board the store up. And, uh, you know, we've had, we had some incidents there and I actually had to file a police report from, um, getting some threats up from customers and they've, you know, customers have been getting thrown out of the store for being rude. Like this pandemic hit and like, I have literally lost all faith in humanity. Like people, you know, something like this happens and people just turn into the biggest pieces of shit on the face of the earth. It's insane. Yeah. Not everybody, but there's a selected few. And, uh, you know, when I filed the police report, the guy, you know, I was talking to the cop on the phone and I was telling him what happened. And, you know, he was like, well, you know, we're gonna, you guys are, I told him, you know, what business it was. And he was like, well, you know, that's, you guys are a mom and pop staple in this town. We're going to do whatever we can to right. make sure everything is good. And, you know, like they literally put patrol, you know, <laughs> going by our store when it was closed every night, like uh, cops would yeah. cruise by there like two or three times in, in a night just to make sure everything was okay. Along with all the other businesses there in the area. But yeah, everyone, that was one of the things I couldn't get away with shit when I was a kid because everyone knew my parents, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and mainly my dad, because he is a very well liked person. He does a lot of favors for people and he's run that place for, God, I think 44 years now. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I couldn't get away with shit. If I was doing <laughs> something wrong, oh, that's John's kid. Phone call. <laughs> I'd get home and uh, that look on his face, just like, you know, and, uh, yeah, my, my dad was pretty, he was pretty, he was, he was a very strict dad. He's like my best friend now, but yeah. he, uh, he was not a friend. He was not the friend parent. He was more like a drill sergeant <laughs> when I was growing up. So he didn't want to piss him off. Yeah. Yeah. My, you know, it's funny. My dad growing up, it's like, he, he was very strict. And then the day I turned 18, it was like a, a light switch and he was, ne he never redirected me. He never got on to me. He never, it was the weirdest thing. Cause he was like, <laughs> like on me until the day I was 18 and then boom, it was over with. It was, it's a very weird phenomenon. I don't know what happened. They, their, uh, their parenting is done. <laughs> right. And he's like, he's like, poof, give me they're, they're like, I'm done being a parent. He's on his own. <laughs> you know, if he wants advice or help, I'm here, but yeah, it's, 
even with some of my friends that still go into the store, like the guy, this, uh, I have a friend named Dan that grew up down the street from me. And he actually, he shapes all my surfboards for me now. Um, and he has to go in the hardware store from time to time. And he, uh, it's like, what, what's up with your dad? He's like a completely different person than what he was <laughs> when we were kids. Like he's fun yeah. and mellow. Like I think, I think all my friends were afraid of my dad. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> he was very intimidating when he wanted to be. Hey, you got a question here from uh, Priscilla. She asks you, uh, any new gear or toys? <laughs> yes, I do have some new toys. I just got something today. Well, first of all, I do have nice. a nice little, I've been, I got a little bit of a problem with my amp collection over there. And I just got that angle last week. It's the uh, Angle Artist Edition. I used to use Angles all the time when I was in Europe. I'd always rent. I think it was a Powerball when we would go over there when I was still using Real Heads Live. Now I just use my Axe Effects. But um, they make some good stuff. But it's like their most simple amp, the Artist Edition, for me, is hands down the best sounding. It doesn't, it, you know, it's just simple two channels whatever but it sounds fantastic and i just got this today in the mail what is that bad boy this is called a channel in a box um steve evitz got me or convinced me to get one of these it's um what I, the way i record guitars now is i have you know i'm in my studio right now but I, right outside my studio i have an isolation room with a 412 cabinet in there. So I hook up a bunch of mics into that. It goes, you know, everything goes through my ceiling here. And then I have this nifty little summing box made by okay. Black Lion Audio. So I, you know, I'll hook up like anywhere between five to eight microphones on that thing, depending on what I can fit in there. And I won't use them all at the same time, but I'll get the amp kind of where I want with a 57. And then I'll just start blending in all the other mics so I don't have to do it, you know. I just like the way it sounds better when I do it analog. Right. So I'm, I'm blending all those mics together in an analog world, and then I'm going into my DAW with it, and I just kind of commit to it. And if I want to change it, I can always reamp it. But I want to use this. Um, it's uh, it's basically uh, a channel off the uh, 9098, I think it is, mixing board. It's made by Rupert Neves. And so I can have a um, little bit of EQ and compression before, after the summing box into uh, my computer. Nice. If I move my camera around too much, you might see a washing machine. So uh... <laughs> is that what you got back there? Because it's all smoke and mirrors over here at the uh, Talk to Me compound. Well, you know, you gotta you gotta stay clean. <laughs> Uh, what, what was the uh, reasoning on moving the album up? Did we talk about that? No, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> You're on a need to know basis. Yeah. I mean, dude, I've been so busy with other things, you know, it's everyone is at home writing right now. I'm just getting, I'm getting hit up for mixing, producing, yeah. um, to the point in the first time in my life that I've had to turn it down because I've had or turn down some things because I just, I'm like, yeah, I can do it, but you might have to wait six months until oh. I get around to it. And um, I just finished recording uh, this band called Void Vader, based oh, out of L. Yeah. yeah. Lucas, the guitar player singer, he filled in for me at OzFest, Mexico, um, a couple years ago because I had to be at my brother's wedding that day. And I was his best man. So. We flew him from L.A. to Mexico with the boys, and he played one show and then flew back to L.A., and then I flew from Austin, you know, back onto the tour. Um, I did not produce that. I did not, and I'm not mixing it either. I, they just basically, you know, they just kind of self-produced, and he just wanted me to record uh, guitars here, and then we recorded guitars, and then he's like, can we do bass here, too? And I'm like, yeah, sure, we can do bass. And <laughs> After that, I was like, can we still, can we do vocals here too? Yeah, sure. Let's do vocals. And that was, uh, Lucas is an extremely good guitar player. One, yeah. uh, definitely one of the best guitar players I have 
um, I've ever seen in the metal scene. He's, he's awesome. And now I just got files from a band called Tortured Saint out of Toronto. Okay. And this will be the second record I've mixed by them. They, uh, one of the guys in the band is friends with, um, my rep for my string company, SIT. His name's Hoogie. And he's, uh, <clears throat> he's, uh, the bass tech for Shinedown as well. Really, really cool guy. And so he hit me up a couple years ago and was like, you know, we check out this band, Tortured Saint, you know, friend of mine is in the band they want you to mix it and it's like like because it was coming from hoogie i wasn't going to say no it's like yeah yeah, (laughs) of course of course i'm going to do it here you know you're you i'm not going to say no and i got the files and i was a little bit scared because you know they're a local band they're not signed and you never know what you're going to get and there's a lot of bad metal bands out there. You know, I've gotten so many demos over the last 16 years. And honestly, I would say maybe four or five I liked. And, uh, but when I heard Tortured Saint and I started checking out all the files, I was extremely impressed. But I, and I hadn't unmuted the singer yet. Like I just listened to the drums, guitar, and bass. And then I unmuted the singer and then I was you know, blown away again. Like, I had never met the guy. I'd never seen him live, but I could just tell from his projection and his ferocity and his vocals that I was just like, dude, this guy is fucking pissed off. And it sounded <laughs> so good. And I had so much fun mixing that record. And Des heard that record when I, you know, they gave me a little video teaser to put on my Instagram. And um, I think I actually mastered that record too which I don't do anymore. I don't deal with mastering anymore. Um, too many different streaming services. I don't like it. <laughs> so um, I put this teaser of the record out on um, on my Instagram and Des heard it and was like, hey, dude, you mix this, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, he was the one that uh, got me, you know, the gig with uh, Wednesday 13 to uh, produce nice. and mix their record. And we're going to do another record in January. So you never know where things are going to lead, you know? And, oh, yeah. It's it's one thing into another. Yeah. And, you know, once again, like working with Wednesday, I didn't really know what I was getting into because um, I had heard the Murder Dolls back in the day. I wasn't a big fan. Um, I did see one of their last shows on Halloween at the Roxy. And I actually really did like them live. I thought Wednesday was an incredible frontman, And... um. I agreed to do the record and I went and saw them at the whiskey. And once again, completely blown away. Like, I don't know why Wednesday 13 is not, is, isn't as big as Rob Zombie. Right. Because he is like everybody on that static X tour, you know, it was, you know, Raven black and static X. And to tell you the truth, a lot of the, the crew on that tour from all the bands, you know, I had a couple of them come up to me like, dude, you guys are fucking awesome live, but Wednesday's <laughs> band, they're definitely like my, the best part of the show for me. And I'm like, dude, me too. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> like he puts so much effort into his shows. It's, it's really, really fun to watch. And yeah, I- they've gotten heavier over the years too. Yeah, they're not yeah. like this punk band that, that they were back in the day. And, um, you know, once again, I just had so much fun working with those guys and I was really blown away of how, like I'd kind of pushed them aside too. You know, I never really gave Wednesday 13 the time of day yeah. and we had, we had done sound wave together in Australia. I don't think I ever got the chance to watch them, but I would always see, you know, the Wednesday 13 guys, they're kind of hard not to notice, <laughs> right. you know, walk, walking around backstage and whatnot, never talked to them. And not until Jeff and I did this uh, uh, guitar clinic tour many years ago in um, in the UK okay. with uh, when I was with that company Blackstar, and um, we played our last show in Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, you know the band went to the airport. Jeff and I got a hotel, and there's this venue that we play there sometimes 
called the garage and okay. they just turn it into a club, you know, from time to time. And so I'm like, all right, let's go to the garage. And Wednesday was there and his guitar player, Ramon. And Ramon and I had a big, long conversation about Carcass's record, Heartwork. Oh, what a great record. Yeah, like... If I ever find someone that likes that record as much as I do, because to me, that's the best death metal record of all time. That's yeah. like, that's the black album for death metal. I it agree. Is, and no one will ever top it. I don't care what anyone puts out. Carcass Heartwork and Doth, uh, The Hinders. Yeah. Those are my two favorite death metal records. And I guess Ramon and I just, sat there and drank beers and talked about carcass for probably like two hours straight. And, you know, I talked to Wednesday uh, a fair amount too that day and didn't talk to him again for probably like four or five years until Des suggested I <laughs> produce that record. And uh, I don't think e any of us really remembered that night very well. We we're all pretty, we were pretty hammered, but uh, we got along really well on that one. It was a lot of fun. I remember when I had Jeff Walker of Carcass on the podcast, I was arguing with oh, him. Yeah? I argued with him that Heartwork was his best album, and he wanted to tell me, I'm trying to get the name right, but uh, he was telling me that their their best album was... Uh, Necroticism? I believe so, yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. what he was going with. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, that's Heartwork. <laughs> like, nope, it, it's Heartwork. It's just like but, the... It, it's almost like the prototype like metalcore album sound. Like It sounds like every album that came out 10 years later. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like the Meshuggah syndrome, like Meshuggah yeah. in a way they're gent and they open yeah. up the gates for that genre, but no one really calls them gent. Right. And the same thing with carcass, like you're right. It is kind of got a metal core vibe to it, but no one would ever call no. carcass metal core. No, yeah. no, not at all. But yeah, yeah, it's just funny how that, that album sounds so good. And, you know, you could almost put it up against, you know, the kill switches and whatnot that came out years later for like a BM and they probably sound pretty similar. Yeah, that I love that record. It is so good. And I can't believe how well Jeff Walker can still sing. We did 70,000 tons of metal with yeah. them and our guitar player, Neil, wasn't really familiar with Carcass. And I mean, he didn't do a lot of metal like that, but he had never really taken the time to listen to him. And, you know, I was like, dude, come on, we're going to go watch Carcass. <laughs> and like Jeff Walker's screams are still just so fucking brutal. You know, they yeah. were playing um, the first track on that album, Buried Dreams. Yep. They were playing that and Jeff just breaks out this massively long scream, you know, coming from this guy that, God, I mean, he must be in his his fifties at this point, right? Early fifties, I would say. Yeah, we got to be mid, yeah, early to mid fifties, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I just look over at Neil, and it's like jaws on the floor, just <laughs> like, good God, he's like, it, it's just, it's awesome. I love that band. Yeah, great band. Back to Wednesday Thirteen, he has one of the best things going on tour with his with the fans of Wednesday Thirteen will bring him just boxes of action figures <laughs> just like yeah. or, or he could just be like you know what man i really need this one specific he-man and in in like a week and a half someone shows up with it so so he's got the best gig out there when it comes to collecting toys yeah and you know he's got that uh wednesday's world show yeah. he's been doing and <laughs> he, he's got three episodes and honestly dude me and my girlfriend i mean we just we have so much fun watching those like that that guy is such a character it's crazy i mean wednesday is probably one of the most unique people i think i've ever met he is he's an interesting guy yeah in yeah. In, in, in a very wonderful way and uh <laughs> i mean me, me and my girlfriend just get absolutely it was like you know when he sends me the episodes he's like man you know make sure you get high as fuck before you watch it that that's key and um yeah so we just smoke a shitload of pot and <laughs> watch away and it's just it's fucking hilarious i love that show i, I get so excited when he makes a new one yeah it's, it's it's always fun man to i love his you know his north carolina accent too it probably sounds a lot like mine but it's it's just like it's just, just fun to hear him kind of 
yeah, man, you know, when I grew up in a trailer and all this other stuff. And then he comes out with like condolences and, you know, which was probably one of my favorite albums that year. Yeah. That, that, that was, dude. That's, that's definitely the album that has some songs that really caught my attention Yeah, compared to his older stuff. But uh, yeah, he's, he's got this, and like I said, I love industrial music and he's got this nice blend between goth, metal, industrial, and it's, uh, you know, he's also actually into country from what I remember. Yeah. You don't really hear it in some of his music, but <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really pleasantly surprised when uh, I really started to dig into uh, his catalog before I ended up doing that record. Yeah, man. I can't wait to hear it. That's uh it's funny, man. We've hit about an hour. I think last time I talked to you, we hit about an hour and uh, you're very easy to talk to man. I appreciate that. Sometimes it's like fighting people trying to get answers out of people. <laughs> not me not you at all man but uh well as we kind of as we kind of wrap this one up you know dealing with demons uh, part one volume one however you want to say it october 2nd uh looks like part two is going to be out early next year and then were you saying you're basically already writing for a new album or are you just writing songs i always write and some of the stuff you know it may or may not end up on uh um on a devil driver record i did this record for a music library uh with some of the old guys in devil driver years ago and they ended up calling it terror metal it was for a music library called extreme music and i've always wanted to put out another one and i've you know i start working on it and then our record cycles over and i have to kind of concentrate on devil driver again and so i've i've got quite a few songs for that they only accept like, I think you have to write 10 songs at a time. Otherwise they won't accept the record. Like you have to give them like a full 10 songs, vocals, everything. And I do want to do another record like that. And I do have a bunch of songs for it, but I just haven't had a chance to finish them. Hmm. But Neil's written, he's been writing a lot of songs for the next devil driver. And, uh, but with the way things are going and having a new Devil Driver record out coming out in October, and then the next one, I think, might be coming out in March. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but sometime early next year. And so it's it's going to be a while until Devil Driver goes in the <laughs> studio again, I think. And I want to say that there's actually going to be some leftover songs as well. After uh, we recorded 20 songs, and I believe we're only releasing 17 between the two records. Okay. So there's actually going to be three more. I don't know when or if they're going to get released. I, I think they'll be getting released eventually. So there's a lot of stuff coming out. So when will the Sprites or industrial album come out? You got the perfect last name for an industrial album. You think so? It, oh, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't sound right for me. Yeah, well, if you say it with a German accent, yeah, yeah you got to. Kind of cool. <laughs> but yeah, the Americans don't know how to say it right. They're always saying spritzer, or well, no one knows how to pronounce it. It's funny trying to spell it because you have to remember that it's I before E, except after spritzer. So, like, well, in the German language, if you have an E and an I together, yeah, you pronounce the second one. Oh, okay, there we go. And I, I don't think there's any exceptions to the rule in that language. So, no, there's no exceptions to any rule in Germany. <laughs> exactly. Just, uh. Well, cool, Mike, man. Well, thanks for taking the time tonight. Thanks for coming on, doing it live. And uh, we'll get this out podcast form soon. And it's up on YouTube and all that great stuff. And it's always fun uh, catching up with you, man. Good to see you, man. Hopefully, once this COVID thing is over, I'll see you at a show soon. Yes, I will be out. Uh, I took shows for granted for way too long, and I'll go to as many as I can now. Yeah, I'm hoping hoping everyone feels that way once things open up again. All right, man. Well, again, we said uh, the new Devil Driver dealing with Demons Volume 1 out October 2nd. Mike, thanks for taking the time tonight. You're welcome. Talk to you soon, bro. See ya. <laughs>